Hello and Assalamu Alaikum from Islamabad. Today we are very proud to be part of the Leaders in Islamabad Business Summit. This summit has got its own record from the past four years. It's attracting the world talent, it's attracting the world leader to come in Islamabad and talk about the, the burning and emerging issues and try to try to work together to put up some resolution and the way forward where the world or at least the countries who are, are participating there, they can take some notes from there and uh, implement those, uh, uh, those resolutions or those recommendations. My name is Sajid Aslam. I'm head of ACCA Pakistan. This particular session today we are going to run is around the correlation of ethical practices and the business valuation. So we all know the ethics are important. And we all know that in personal life and the professional life, we have to demonstrate that. Today, we are trying to explore the correlation that there is a non-financial reward, there is a reputation, there is a spiritual uh, value when, while we are acting as an ethical or we are deploying the ethical practices. But at the same time, there is a financial reward we have seen uh, the businesses are getting while they are doing the right thing for the right reason. Ethics is not only about the individuals, how they are behaving. It's also about the, the entire value chain of those individuals, which are very well knitted as a business which we know as an artificial entity maybe, but those again underlying they are, they are individuals who are very well knitted in that value chain to run that business. So we have to see that how that value chain, all the people, if they are working with the right practices in an ethical way and they are introducing the right uh, kind of behaviors within the businesses with their stakeholders, with their supplier customers, with the other stakeholders, even the regulators, how it's going to change the valuation of that business and how the investor will see it in term of uh, the share price maybe, right? So this is the correlation which we are trying to explore. Just to give you the background, the ACCA is a 117 year old organization started back in 1904. It was a challenge to the status quo. It was again, something where the eight people gathered and started working on, on the agenda where they felt that something is not right. In 1904, when we talk about the profession of accounting, that was reserved for only the elitist people in the society. And the cost to become accountant was so high that it was creating an artificial barrier and a lot of people of ability were unable to join that. So the eight people who gathered and they decided that's not on. We have to create the opportunity for everyone who has a, a ability and who want to develop themselves as an accountant and create that or deliver that public value, which an accountant is supposed to deliver. And in 1904, they started with a very inclusive approach. Just to remind people in Europe in 1904, women did not have a right to vote. And ACCA started with a very clear version that everybody is equal and everybody who has an ability, regardless of gender and the social background, they should be a part of that uh, opportunity and they should become a part of that organization. In 1909, we have a first uh, woman member there. And then the history starts. And uh, right now, if we talk about the organization, ACC has a presence in uh, 180 countries almost. And we are working with almost 225,000 plus members. And there are half a million students or plus students who are on the journey to become ACC members. It's not all. ACCA do understand its responsibility in terms of creating that public value and delivering the public value. For the last 75 years, we are delivering on a professional insight. These are the documents and the research and the opinions which we collect around the world and then share it with our business partners, with our learning partner, with our members, with our students, really to make them understand what are the new trends, what are the patterns which we are seeing there, what are the practices which are changing and how they can contribute back to their employer, their client and the society they are operating in. And this professional insight help us to really elevate the brand, the reputation of ACCA and make sure we are talking about the, the issues which are very core cool and we, we should have a very authentic and the bold voice. And the same goes with our members as well. When they are in a certain situation, they can be very ethical, authentic and bold while calling out the behaviors and the things which may not be right. So ACC has a history challenging the status quo. And we, we are very, very proud of that. And we would like to continue with that. Today, we are joined by our council members. The ACCA council is a, is a global council. And that's a very diverse 
uh, there's a diversity which you can see in terms of the gender, in terms of the nationality, in terms of the background, in terms of the age. And that diversity which we have seen at the council level really helped the organization to be guided in a way that whenever whatever country, whatever city, whatever stakeholder we interact, we try to understand what their real needs are. We try to work with the empathy. We try to stay entrusted. We listen. And then we try to bring a solution which is not, uh, uh, w which is very customized for their need. So today we are joined by Arthur Lee, FCCA, fellow uh, ACCA member, assistant president and company secretary, CGN New Energy Holding and Co. Limited, Hong Kong, uh, SAR, China. Lee is a seasoned professional with the experience in IPO and investor relationship, accounting, finance, taxation, corporate planning, and strategy. Uh, Lee was the, very instrumental when the IPO happened for CGN, and it was 500 times oversubscribed. And he managed that by, by maintaining a certain uh, relationship with the investor, working with the sell-side analyst and the investment fund. He is a fellow ACCA with a degree in information engineering from uh, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, as well as MBA from University of Warwick and a Master of Corporate Governance degree with distinction from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. He also possesses the PRC legal professional qualification. So welcome, Lee. Welcome to our, our session today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. We are also joined by... Uh, Ayla Majid. Ayla Majid is a fellow member of ACCA, Managing Director for Financial Advisory and Khalid Majid Rahman, KMR, uh, from Pakistan. Ayla is a, is a very seasoned professional again, and she's an international speaker and a strong advocate of sustainability, takes part in contributing uh, to important themes like digital transformation, Belt and Road Initiative, future of work, future of energy, and sustainable infrastructure. Ayla is also part of the World Economic Forum Young Group uh, Global Leaders. Uh, she is also part of the Global Future Council of Energy of World Economic Forum. So uh, Ayla is also a fellow member of ACCA, serving on ACCA Council. Uh, she holds MBA from LAMS. She is LLB from University of London. And uh, uh, she's also has got, uh, uh, she's alumnus of Harvard Ken Kennedy School, University of Oxford. So welcome, Ayla, to our session today. Thank you, Sajid. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we are also joined by John Colin, fellow member of ACCA, partner and uh, insolvency practitioner, uh, Menzies LLP UK. John is a partner in Menzies, and uh, he heads up the corporate and the recovery insolvency department. He has over 30 year experience with the company in a financial distress. She also led the group involved in the formation of implementation of uh, governance changes in a global organization. He's a part of a better place to work team at uh, Menzies, as well as he's a proud to lead the diversity and inclusion strategy for the firm. Interestingly, John is, a, John is definitely, he's a fellow member of ACCA. He also holds a degree in music and composition uh, from UK University. So welcome, John, to our session today. Good morning. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you. We are also joined by Mariam Abisola. She's a fellow member of uh, uh, ACCA, Managing Director of J Concept Z Limited uh, from Nigeria. Uh, Mariam is Lagos-based business leader who has spent over 20 years in developing strategy and leadership and financial management skill while contributing to the growth of leading brands. She has held across uh, roles across West Africa and Europe. Uh, in multinationals as well as the accounting practices. Uh, Mariam is a co-owner of uh, Babalula Effie Edi Farati Foundation, which has improved the life of over 3,000 Nigerian with free medical care, food supply, school fee, and the clean water supply. Mariam is an ACCA fellow member and serving on its global council. She runs the food and beverage company in Nigeria. So welcome, Mariam. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us today. And as I uh, earlier mentioned, this is a, one of a great forum, Leaders in Islamabad, which is managed by Nutshell Conferences and the Corporate Pakistan Group. Uh, and it has got its own reputation and it has uh, really attracted the global leader to talk about uh, the future of the world, the future of the world. And today we are going to talk about the correlation of the practices and particularly ethical practices and uh, the business valuation, how it's going to impact current or future business valuation for us. So I'll start with a 
with a question, and that is for everybody. What are the key ethical practices or behavior a business expected to demonstrate in journal? So what, what we should be expecting from a business when we talk about the ethical practices? What is the scope of that ethical practices? So we start with Arthur, you, and then uh, I think we will take the, the comment from everybody uh, one by one. Thank you so much. Uh, to me, I think there's key, some key behavior, key, I mean, value that have to behave, demonstrate to the others that the business have to be so that they are honest. I mean, to tell the people what is necessary to be, I mean, just go, uh, to be tell and transparent, to necessarily, I mean, avoiding the confidential issues, they should tell the others that what they are doing and to avoid conflicts of interest as well, make sure that there's no agency problem. Uh, to me, that means uh, you have to you have to, you need to have the right people in the right system. That means you have recruited the right people that they have gone through the good training on all these uh, ethical values before they can get in, and they have to be uh, properly screened, you know, screen and get the best person to come in. And during the whole of their career in this company, you have to be well trained and to make sure that they continue to receive admins and I mean properly educated on all these good values. And also they have a channel for them to feedback if something went wrong. Of course, we have to have a good system in place for the company as well. That means we have to have a very good, I mean, uh, process, procedures that to make sure that people can follow. I mean, either it's like electronically or manually, whatever, that people can follow all these procedures to make sure that they are conform with the ethical behavior. Of course, we, we all know that other than process itself, we also we have to review regularly. We have to do the audit, the post-mortem review regularly to make sure that all these values are put into place. If as anything that is not in conform the value of the company on all this honesty, on transparency and conflict of interest things, that we have to be reported and uh, correct all these issues. I think all these are very important behaviors that you have to demonstrate to the to the commit to the, to the public for the business that this company have the right people have the right system to demonstrate all these value are in place. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. And if we if we if we expand that conversation, I think the Lee picked up two points there. The one is uh, the having that training and understanding of the key behaviors what are expected, and number two the the system or mechanism where people can really speak up and call out those behavior if those are not uh, being complied with so i think these are the the two key very relevant areas so if we come to you i for for the same question what does it mean ethical practice in businesses uh, uh, for you so how how you will expect a business to behave in a society ethically thank you so much um, so um agree with all that arthur said and i'll only be adding to that I would say maintaining and being mindful of rights of all stakeholders, um, whosoever may be connected with the business, whether this is uh, uh, there are shareholders, whether there are employees, whether suppliers, whether it is the society, and whether it is planet at large. I would say that being mindful of the rights of all stakeholders is very key to being um, ethical and then practicing uh, uh, or uh, bringing in uh, ethics at the forefront. Of course, uh, it goes without saying that uh, honesty, integrity, transparency, uh, all of that needs to be there. Um, and what we see now, uh, the preference of various stakeholders, even for that matter, investors and of course, um, the shareholders, they are now uh, more and more have become appreciative and they understand that we need to protect and be mindful of the rights of all stakeholders, be it a cons consumer, be it uh, say anyone who's affected or uh, sort of uh, comes even close to an impact of a business. So all of that, um, I think, um, uh, would sort of fall in the realm of ethical pra practices. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, that's what I would say, um, uh, to, just to sort of summarize it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ayla. So you summarize it as a right of all the stakeholders, including the planet, that's brilliant. And uh, and then it's a it's an obligation of the business really to take care of that and make sure that we are not going to jeopardize that. And then you also highlighted the investors. They are considering 
sustainability and how the organization is behaving as a one of our key uh, criteria while they are evaluating it. So that thank you for that. So John, coming to you, what does John. it mean, ethics? Well, it's it, it's a really good question, uh, Sajid. And Arthur and Isla have really built a foundation on on what are about. You know, we're looking at the practices and behaviours, the ethical practices and behaviours, and who it affects. And we've talked about stakeholders. And you know, it, it used to be that the primary uh, key area for business leaders was to focus on the shareholders. And you know that definition of stakeholders has widened. And arguably, in our current society, um, everybody's a stakeholder because of the connection the, uh, with the internet and social media. Everybody, in some way, is a stakeholder. So the ethical practices and behaviors have to take that into account. So it's not only in relation to the business that that entity is doing, but the way it's doing that business in the community in which it operates. Um, be it a local community or a global community. And that business will be judged um, on what not only what it gives out as a product, but what it gives out to the community. Um, so it has to, it has to when, when we're looking at stakeholders now, the conversation is much wider. Um, you know, the, 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 the impact um, that the business has in the global community and the local community is absolutely key. Um, and that, and, and I think especially young people these days are looking to businesses to do more than supply product. Um, they're looking for businesses to be part of a, a connected world. And in that, uh, in that particular regard, it's, it's really important that the foundation that Isla and Arthur were talking about is, is in place. Thank you, John. And uh, I'll be coming back to you again with a, with a similar question that uh, you are in an insolvency practice. So what are those behavior which lead to insolvency? So what is the, that lack of ethics at some point of time we will be talking, which will bring that, that distress financials or, or, or distress the, the organization in a distress? So Mariam, coming back to coming to you with the same question, ethical practice, what's your view uh, in terms of what the business need to demonstrate to within the society? You are on mute, uh, Mariam. If you can. Thanks, everyone. And I think Arthur, Ailey, and John has done a good job of explaining the context. But let me add that, in my view, it's not just important for businesses to demonstrate ethical practices. It's also important for the individuals within those businesses to also do the same, because that's the way that you build the culture of ethical practices within organizations. And what I think is becoming more important to people is an alignment between what companies say they are and what they actually do in reality and how they operate within the society. So people are looking to businesses to ensure that one, um, they are ethical in their practices, not just by documenting this in their policies or in their value statements, but by stepping up when issues arise globally or within their societies, that they can become a voice for real corporate, good corporate governance and standing up for the rights of diverse people, um, irrespective of you know their gender or race or their background. So people expect organizations to be more ethical and of course to be a voice for corporate governance within societies we look up to our companies to obey the laws of the land so and to pay their taxes of course which helps to expand societies and also support the growth of the societies where they operate and we also expect these organizations to act in the good of the public not just having a short-term view of delivering financial performance, but also understanding that they have a role to play in contributing to good governance, ethics, transparency as a whole. And I, I think I would say that finally, it's important that businesses realize that ethics plays a bigger role today um, because we have a, young, a younger generation, the Gen Z, who are more purpose-driven. Um, these generations are woke. You know, they would question and they would expect businesses to play a bigger role 
because they are more focused around the impact and the challenges that these businesses pose for the societies in which they operate. So if we want to continue to build trust with our stakeholders, ethics is the way to go because you know ethics is that currency that helps you to purchase trust with all the stakeholders um, that you have to interact with as a business. Thank you, Mariam. Lovely. Ethics is a, is a currency to really purchase the trust. I think that's a, that's a bottom line. So, and the trust is the, the one which, which the entire is driven by the, by the, by the business. And that's where the, the financial and the bottom line is driven, even with the trust of the stakeholders, like we discussed earlier. So, uh, before we get to the next questions, a very quick view, uh, John, from your side. You are working with the with the distress organization and insolvency. Anything you can highlight? What what are the lack of ethics uh, which led them to the insolvency or distress situation? Very quick, brief one, and then we move to the next one. Well, really briefly, Sajid. Um, often um, businesses find themselves behaving unethically in desperation. So um, when there is distress, when there is a lack of money. Um, businesses will will look to ways to protect their organization and that can often lead to desperate measures. Um, usually that can be uh, everything from a lack of communication, so ordering supplies um, when there, there's no real chance of um, looking to, you know, in, in, in actually paying the supplier to actually sort of much more nefarious and, and um, much more uh, you know difficult difficult uh, issues but I think you know the, the one thing you know and the, the role of the director is to try and protect that business and sometimes the ethics can get lost in the stress and the strain of distress and one of the things that uh, you know they, they the, you know that the business leaders need in those circumstances is the right advice from the trusted advisors who can come in and actually say it actually demonstrate that uh, the transparency which I think is one of the outcomes of good ethical behavior is often a solution to a really tough financial distress issue and it's that transparency that's the first thing to go and that can often lead to the to the problems that um, that you'll see with the sort of the loss of that ethical behavior no thank you thank you John and I think if if I pick up from the from the couple of minutes which we are discussing right now, uh, I think there's a common theme that ethics is a one of a like Mariam put it in a very eloquently the the it's is a currency to buy or purchase trust and the trust is the basis of any business to really survive or for the longer term. So the what are the the challenges which these businesses face in general not to adopt ethical practices? What drive them to, or what are the, let me put it that way, what are the opportunity and challenges for the businesses uh, once it's come to ethics, professionalism, and trust? Why they deviate from that? And we can start with you, Ayla. Thank you, Sajid. I would say um, two things. Um, it could be greed. Um, maybe uh, businesses, individual organizations, they may like to sort of deviate from ethical practices if there is greed. And the second could be, say, a challenge, say, uh, that uh, people may come across. So when there is a threat or a challenge or an adverse situation, this is where um, uh, the ethics could be at uh, at at risk. Um, now, um, uh, given both, I think the uh, um, uh, uh, the frameworks, uh, the transparency framework, the integrity frameworks, they sort of come in uh, come in play. And if people have the right kind of uh, um, or organizations have the right kind of frameworks available and put in put in place, and there are the right kind of checks. Uh, then one can sort of avoid such situations. Um, we have sort of seen this in, in many different in industries, like in the past decades, past past years, whether it has been the financial industry, whether it has been the energy industry, we all are mindful of the, or, or, or know of the famous case of Enron. And, 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 and likewise, many such examples in different in, in, in industries. At the end of the day, the result is is not that great 
and the reputation goes, say, a long way. Uh, so um, I would say while the, uh, the driving factors of not being ethical could be a challenge or a greed, um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, taking that sort of adverse route has never helped anyone in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, and uh, Arthur, Mariam, uh, John, you want to add something around that? And uh, I, I have a follow-up question on this one, specifically on the greed and uh, uh, frameworks. So I'll come up back with that. So Arthur, Mariam, John, if you want to add something on that. I think, uh, let me just add that the, the pressure that, you know, the directors sometimes face from the shareholders, you know, to improve um, financial results, which is usually focused on short-term results versus long-term is also huge, you know. Um, and of course, the compensation of some of these directors is also linked to, um, you know, the financial performance of the business, which, you know, sort of puts pressure sometimes to on um, directors or business leaders to compromise on the um, on ethic ethical practices. Um, but like Ella has rightly mentioned, you know, focusing on the short term will not help you drive the valuation of your company in the long term. It would only result in um, challenges, um, loss of reputation, loss of your customer base and could actually lead to the demise of the company um, completely like um, Enron, which um, no longer exists today because of these challenges. So what I would say is in the long run, et being ethical pays off um, is what I would say, despite all of the pressures that business leaders face to cut, um, to cut corners. Thank you, Mariam. And that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'll just, the follow-up question I'll bring out there, you brought up a, a very interesting point, the compensation driving a certain behavior. So now the question is that if the compensation is driving the behavior, greed is the one which is driving that uh, or, or, or a one of a force to get to the uh, unethical behaviors within the organization, does that frameworks and the regulation help? Uh, we have seen that even at the time of Enron, or we talk about the financial crisis of 2008, uh, there were a lot of laws and frameworks and the principles which were which were there and uh, the entire value chain involved they just overlooked that so just the compliance or the framework or the principle can really overcome that drive which greed or the compensation can bring to the to the organization what do you feel what what would be your stance or acc stance around it uh, in terms of the regulation versus the personal ethic or a professionalism so, Arthur, if you want to add there. Uh, you are on mute, Arthur. Yep. yep. I, I would say that there is always a cause and benefit to everything. People always to do, I mean, commit something uh, for their personal interests and overlook the, the public thing. Is they always think that they are overconfident themselves. They can cover up all this, I mean, uh, kind of a short term or personal misbehavior. They are always overconfident themselves. They think that it's something that nobody will find out. I mean, in the longer run, this will be smooth out. I mean, uh, it will not happen. The bad thing, the cause element will not happen. We only look at the benefit side. You, uh, you have more money. The company's share price will go up. I mean, uh, over the long term, I mean, this will not be, I mean, uh, found out by the others. Everything can be, can be good. I mean, so that they exert some kinds of, I mean, Personally, I mean, they want to do that because they overlook the cause. And I mean, they overlook the cause on that. They only look at the benefit. At the same time, they push pressure on the others as well, using these kinds of uh, compensation or whatever, use their own power or whatever, or I mean, a relationship, whatever. They push the others to follow that direction as well. So even though there's some regulations, I mean, we need to change the culture as well. We need the people to, to behave and think about that. There's always a cause come with a benefit. Don't always ignore the cause side. I mean, uh, if you misbehave, a course come happen, I mean, you will always, the, the burn out your whole company, burn out your whole career, burn out everything. You have to be free, you have to feel the fear. If you don't feel the fear, you will always ignore the core side and look at, look at the benefit side, you will have problems. So we have to make sure that people change the culture, make sure the culture is doing everybody's mindset. And also you need to have the system in place to make sure that if those subordinates or the other employees 
face the pressure from the others. I mean, uh, they have some channel to speak out and they're protected as well. Because always people commit, I mean, uh, commit kinds of uh, bad ethical behavior because of, uh, I always say three challenges. The first thing is always from the monetary side. They have some inducement. The second part is from the power. I mean, they have, they have some pressure from the, 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 the above to push them. The third part probably is probably some, some relationship. I'm your friend, just, just do me a favor on that. There's some kinds of things, kinds of the major driver for this behavior, this ethical behavior. We have to make sure that they have enough training to make sure they are aware of these kinds of pressure and they will face it. They come to the right person to resolve it. I mean, they have the right channel to sound it out and they are protected. I mean, the protect is very important. If I'm a staff, my, my boss, he got big bonuses. If he, got, he, he can do the, hit the target, he asked me to cook the book. If, I mean, I sound out and not protected, I got fired. I mean, that you have a problem. So we make sure that system is in place for them to report and also we protect the right, those person as well. I think it's something that we have to do on the system side to make sure that they have the right channel to sound out the problems and also they are well protected as well. Thank you, Lee. So it's it's a culture. It's a right balance in the culture processes and the regulation we are talking about. John, I, I, I saw that you want to add something there. Yeah, thank you very much, Sajid. Uh, I, I, and of course, Arthur and Miriam are absolutely right. Um, and culture, I think, to a certain extent, culture and lack of diversity is part of the problem that existed in 2008 in uh, those uh, in that particular uh, crash. And you know, when you're looking at a uh, a boardroom that reflect, you know, where there's there's no reflection of the global community within that boardroom or sort of the wider society, you're going to end up with an echo chamber and you're going to end up with sort of the, the, those more extreme views. And I think, you know, culture is very much part of it. Um, systems, as we talked about, governance uh, is is really important. And I think when you're when you're working in a business, you you have to understand why you're doing it. You have to have that as your first question, um, followed by the how. And the hows the hows almost if you could imagine that the train the train track, the the how provides you the train track to your destination for the why, and and the short termism of um, problems or the lack of diversity in the boardroom or problems with the culture can really be overcome if you remember the, the, the if you've got a good uh, why that you everybody understands and a very strong how how you get from a to b uh, i think that's um that's always uh, helpful uh, thank you john so i think you added that diversity and the why and how we have to be very very clear about and uh, about the how and we should be very close to what why we are doing that so Ayla, I saw that you want to add something there and yes I, I it's it's actually a little bit of challenge when you have to speak after somebody as smart as John so <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to actually stress on the same uh, somewhat similar points that diversity is so important to uh, uh, putting ethics at the forefront it, it is not just in terms of showcasing a very diverse organization or a board, but the diverse uh, diverse thought process when it's sort of, in particularly when it is at a uh, practice at the governance level. Uh, I think that is so key. Um, uh, there may be, say, tons of ethical frameworks, they may be available, but having the right kind of oversight is then what sort of makes uh, things come in practice. So um, uh, once the frameworks are there, there needs to be the right kind of oversight. And then oversight, which has the right kind of diversity within that. So within the governance structures, I think diversity is so important. Uh, and, and, and that can also then address the question or the challenge that John mentioned, the echo chambers or sort of having, say, an environment that, OK, people protecting each other or there's a small, small club just sort of echoing what the other person is saying. So it's, it is it is extremely important to have that. Now, thank you. I, I think we will explore a one area on the technology and then we will go to the valuation. And the, our key question, I'll come back up. Uh, the first question is around the how the technology play the parts in terms of the 
ethical future so definitely that's a, that's a one question which we want to explore but after that we will get to the question how investors should be putting a value on those ethical practices how they will figure out that this business is really uh, doing the right things and because they are not a part of business they are they are still like the outsider and they have to look at the share of prices and whether it's a listed company or unlisted company if they are making a decision how they will explore that uh, that ethical practices and the behavior there so first question is around the technology and uh, then we will come to the valuation methodology what the how they should be looking at those and how they should put a value on the on the on those practices which we we were discuss so technology is the first thing so we can start with uh, uh, mariam so we will invite everybody for their comments on that technology part mariam yep thank you thank you thank you, thank you sajid um, we know that the, the future of work continues to be um, heavily reliant on technology and you know technology has advanced to stages where you know some of us didn't imagine so many years back you know with with the globalization the immediate 24 hours connections that we now have um which you know um was far-fetched just a few years ago i remember the first time that i used the personal computer was only after i graduated from university in 2000 so that's how you know that's that's how far you know, that the world has come um, with respect to technology. And, you know, um, I remember I was having a conversation with my family and, you know, I said, when I was younger, we didn't even have the internet um, I'm, and we didn't have Facebook. And my kids said, mommy, the founder of Facebook is younger than you. So it's obvious, <laughs> you know, so um, yes, Technology is evolving um, and it poses challenges from an ethical point of view. Um, we all know about some of the false um, stories and information that gets circulated in some of these technological platforms or social connection platforms, right? So I believe that the accounting profession, um, the ACCA, continues to play a key role in being a voice of reason to ensure that as we go through this technological advancement, we continue to develop this technology in a way that's ethical and in a way that considers the common good um, of the public and the societies in which we operate. Um, issues around how the companies that get, gather data about um, their consumers are able to use that data in a way that's ethical and does not infringe on their rights um, and then how technology, of course, considers the diversity of, um, of everyone when building technologies for the future. What I believe is that because we as accountants um, in our DNA, we have ethics in our DNA, right? Um, it's what we learned before we became qualified as accountants. It's what we continue to reinforce as, um, as the ACCA. And the fact that as accountants, we continue to learn we can stay ahead of the technology curve by guiding our organizations when making decisions around technology um, and ensuring that we are a sounding board for good governance to remain, even though um, changes to technologies are evolving. And, and I'm just going to give an, another example where, for example, um, in the past, it was unheard of you know, to sign some confidential information or some important contracts or documents without actually physically signing the documents right some regulators would not even accept it but now look at with technology we're able to do that remotely and email approvals to our teams yes we can do that but that opens up a completely new set of risk um, to the business um, opportunities for people to um, carry out frauds um, approve some of these transactions um, fraudulently. So we as accountants need to make sure that within our organizations, we're supporting our businesses to understand the, tech, um, the risk that technology brings, and we support them as well to be able to address them in an ethical manner. Thank you, Mariam. I think it's it's important. I think the voice of reason, the technology, and technology is going, we are going to adopt that one. So as a, as a core role, as an accountant, you rightly picked up that the, the, 
the, the, the voice of reason. We should be challenging the biases in the data and we should be talking about uh, um, how the AI should be deployed. So I, I think there's an there's a important uh, uh, document which AI, uh, which ACC has produced very recently with the Chartered Accountant ANZ, Ethics for Sustainable AI Adoption. So connecting AI and ESG, I think it's a great document and a great, a great report uh, to refer. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely refer audience to look at that report, Ethics for Sustainable AI Adoption, Connecting AI and ESG. That's a combined research from ACCA and the Chartered Accountant ANC. Uh, just building upon the technology, uh, I like we can have your comment and Arthur and then John, I'll come back to you, come, come to you as well. So technology and how you feel it will play a role there. Um, yes, sure. So I believe that technology can be can be leveraged and actually is already being leveraged to uh, monitor the impact of whatever is being done wherever in the world. So uh, say if it's an investor, an investor trying to measure the impact of their investments, uh, technology has allowed to do that. Now, in terms of doing the ESG mapping, the SDG mapping, technology has now allowed that, um, has allowed that for investors, for various funds. Now we can see that lots of investment is being poured into ESG funds and SDG based funds. Why so? Because technology also plays a role in, in, in sort of uh, understanding the impact of those kind of in, in investments. We have example of the likes of Black Rocks and Goldman Sachs of the world channeling funds towards those areas and not just investors, consumers as well. People are being, people are extremely mindful that they would go for a cup of coffee, which is fair trade. They would go for a t-shirt where, um, where the manufacturer has <laughs> paid fair wages. So um, uh, uh, that is one. Um, and in terms of other consumer choices as, as well, because of, because of that, uh, like Apple has gone green throughout its supply, supply chain because of stakeholders pressure and of course being conscious uh, themselves as well. At the same time, technology bring, uh, brings risk. You yourself have, have mentioned that the risks in, in AI uh, say, uh, so it's 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 important to ensure that the voice of diversity, the voice of reasonability, is there uh, when um, uh, when sort of deploying AI or 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 technology. So what then becomes very important to address such risk is technology and internet governance. So we come back to the same question of frameworks and sort of ensuring that even in that realm, uh, we have all those sort of um, practices there. Thank you. Thank you, Ayla. Uh, Arthur, you want to add something on, on the technology? And John, then I'll come to you. And then we will move to the question around how investors should be looking at and what they should be looking at for the valuation. So Arthur, uh, from your side, sure. anything? Sure. Uh, so, so happened that a few days ago, I just uh, visited the cyber port in Hong Kong, which is a uh, kind of a fintech hub in Hong Kong. Talked about few companies, how they how they doing fintech technologies. Uh, many many interesting ideas that I can share. If you hear that, they have a uh, AI put into place in uh, any money laundering. I mean, uh, software that you can just uh, put in some key data. I mean, they can detect whether this company have some behavior of it, money laundering things. And they can identify the risk as well. Some some of the company doing a risk profile. They put in some data. They use all the big data. I mean, available in the market for this industry, this particular company in the past. They can identify all the risk of this company. And some you can just put in some data in that software. They can identify all the news update you every day on this what's happening in this company. So a lot of fintech things are happening in the world. These technology things help people to identify whether this company is ethically, I mean, behave or not. In the past, probably as long as you are running global business, I'm, if I'm here, you are just um, many, many miles away. I don't know what, whether you have an ethical company or, or not, if I want to do business with you. But now with the FinTech, all these things, just put in your data. They will search through the, the internet, whatever machine, in, in feedback to you, whether this company is an ethical company. So technology is really an enabler for us to, I mean, to, to measure 
or, or to find out whether a, 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 the investment the company is an ethical company or, or not. I think it's really, I mean, it changed the whole world in terms of uh, how technology can be used. I mean, in a lot of things. And uh, probably we'll talk about the valuation later on. Yeah. Thanks. John, anything to add on the technology part? Uh, Sajid, only very briefly because I um, uh, feel the same way Isla did in the last question. I've, I've, um, I've it's really been very, very well covered by my uh, very capable colleagues. But uh, technology to, to date has been a tool, and you know I can imagine sometime in the future there'll be some artificial intelligence laughing at me for for you know giggling in the background for me saying that. But we're we're not we're not quite there yet, um, and as such, it's entirely reliant in, on on the humans at this stage driving the you know how it behaves and what it does and the risks are that it, it can it can make money so it can it can provide an, an easy source um, to provide some real capital and value but that's back to the short termism and that's uh, you know the, the, the word governance has been used a lot so far and um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of governance um, and you know, we, we must remember that the government, it has to match the governance and the culture. Um, but there are the risks from AI and it's not just um, AI taking over the world and realizing that, you know, we, it, it's, it's more important than us. But for businesses to be sustainable, um, there has to be at this stage, people in business and that has to, have, has to have some positive impact on the community. And the risk with AI that takes the people out of the business and therefore it creates effectively a, a very time limited business going forward in that you know the, if once the people are out what you know what's the purpose so we'll have to we'll either have to redefine ai potentially or redefine purpose or redefine you know pe people's role eventually um but in the in the meantime it's it's key that the processes have a human and ethical um foundation Thank you, John. I think we will uh, explain that, how the AI and the people and the people in the business, how they should be behaving. Now we come to our core question. So we explored uh, explore certain areas that what does ethics mean and how the technology play into, in, into that, why the businesses should be looking at the sustainability, uh, how we should be looking at the diversity and the inclusion, and how we can bring the transparency and the assurance. And we have to make sure whatever we are doing, that's reported uh, in a right way. So. If you look at this one, so if I'm an investor and I have to put a value on a, on a share price or if I'm going to acquire a startup or if I'm investing in a startup, how as an investor, I'll number one, explore whether these practices exist and how I'll put a value around it uh, in my valuation. What would be my consideration there? So how number one, I'll explore that it exists. There are ethical practices. And number two, how I'll put a value around it. So Ayla, if we can start with you and uh, you know, we can come to the, uh, the other participant. Uh, sure, yes. Uh, so I, I think that has already come about in practice um, and um, something that I mentioned earlier that the investor's preference has already sort of is, is now more towards sustainability, good practices, um, uh, say doing all the right things. And uh, companies have started to sort of realize this and they are um, uh, big corporations, big companies, they are altering their long term growth business plans, keeping those considerations that uh, that uh, what is that the market is asking them to do. And all of this reflects in the value uh, valuation of a company. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just make a mention of uh, uh, one of the recent commitments of BP uh, they have done with regards to changing their portfolio or sort of putting more weight towards sustainable energy uh, because there is a push um, from investors, from the market. It impacts their valuation as well. And then there are so many other companies that is just one sector just to sort of give an example, example of. Seasoned investors have now sort of started to sort of channel their investments towards more sustainable, more ethical businesses and more sort of good in, in industries. And one of the key reasons, of course, is coming from within, but also from the consumer preference. If we look at, say, the younger generation, um, uh, 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 the Gen Z and, 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 and everyone, people are more mindful of, uh, uh, of, of, of sort of where they want to work. Uh, 
um, uh, what kind of business that they want to do, uh, what is their purchasing preference. So all of that has actually now resulted into that, that does result into companies or businesses valuation as well. Um, if, if there are say, if, if you look at the capital markets, if there is say two businesses with identical sort of financials, but one has better practice, practices mm -hmm. it is now all being shown in the integrated reporting so yeah so i would say that that automatically has started to come in the value valuation no, great great uh, so integrated report is a one area where people should be looking at how they are they are reporting so uh, and how they are doing on on ethical practices so arthur from your side and then john i'll come to you and mariam i'll come to you last and uh, yep arthur sure. from your side lee Sure. Uh, probably know, everyone knows this. I, I do investor relations and talk to investors over, over hundreds of, I mean, several hundreds of investors every, every year. Uh, what they feedback to, to me is um, the, the value, the value of the company, which is ethical, ethical. Of that, that, I mean, how they look at that, they will look at how your numbers behave, whether you, you, do, you do your promise, whether you are an honest person or, or not. Every year, give me good, good, good milestone thing that I'm going to do this, do this, do this. And eventually you fail all your promises. They were not going to give you a premium or evaluation on that. And whether you're transparent or not, I mean, the minimal, minimum requirement for disclosure in Hong Kong is a half year. If you can disclose more, like some company disclose their revenue numbers every month, it shows the investor that this is more transparent company. They are more robust in delivering. I mean, more confidence in delivering more data to the investors. They're putting value on that. I mean, uh, and also, whether you, you always demonstrate to the investors that whether you are doing a funny business or not. If you always behave something that you, your senior executive always have a luxury perks and have a, I mean, uh, you use company money to buy a house somewhere and whatever, I mean, deluxe, some, something like this. I mean, they think that hey, this company is not something that I have to avoid. So then we put all these things together and measure yourself, benchmark yourself if the, the uh, similar companies, I mean, in, in that circle, if you have bad, badly behaved company, probably you're downgraded, just like credit rating, you're downgraded. Probably they will not, if your cash flow valuation is $4, I would say that this is a bad company, we just get them 50% discounts in, and use a market practice. I give you $2 valuation. If you are always exist, I mean, deliver your promise. You always have good transparency. You have no demonstration of those funny things. I mean, uh, seeing executive perks, whatever. I give you a more premium. If uh, the valuation told me is $4, the market probably give you $6 or even above. I mean, something like this to reward you that you, you guys are doing the right behavior. Of course, I mean, if you have to demonstrate several years of sustainability that this year I do this, this year I do this, every year I keep my promise to give them demonstration that we are sustainable, the business. We are not focusing on short term and I mean, the loss of the long term things. I mean, over the time, over the time, they'll give you more and more valuation. So yes, uh, I think the valuation reflection on ethical behavior is not something that we will see you overnight. I mean, give you the premium. But over the time, you can demonstrate to the investor that you are a very honest person. You, are, you have a robust ethical value systems. You, you always keep your promise. I mean, they'll give you, they'll give you a value. And of course, I mean, uh, this valuation is not happen only on the, ex, on, the, on the buy, also on the hold and sell as well. Whether you continue to keep, your, keep, keep this investment or they will sell you, it depends on whether you can still behave in that ethical manner. If you change, I just sell you. If I found out that over your, your CEO, your chairman disappear, if some company he commit a crime, I'll just sell you overnight. I won't. I won't just. I mean, find out what happens. I'll just sell you overnight. I won't. I won't invest in this company further. This is what our, uh, the investor feedback to me. How they will value. I mean, the uh, ethics in, in their valuation. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um. Uh, thank you, Sajid. Well, I mean, Arthur's summarized it perfectly. Um. That level of trust and transparency is exa exactly what your investor needs. And, um. But it, it it works both ways. Um. You know, you've got your either personal investor, um, who has to be able to trust the business that it invests in, um. Or you've got your corporate, your fund manager, who's has to be able to trust, um, their investment on behalf of their clients. That there's a reverse to that. So. Uh, when you're looking at for investment as a business, you want to be seen to have the right type of invest investors on board. Okay. So um, the, the trust and transparency works both ways. 
and um, certainly it can be a, if you're if you're driving your business forward and you have the backing of an ethically minded investor um, with a, with a demonstrable hi investment history then actually you know despite the the um, you know the, the financial benefits that you get from the investment you get this societal benefit where people see that the organization as a whole is the right type of organization yeah no, thank you john i think very well put there like it's a two-way street it's a it's not a one way so the the companies also value that how the the investors are behaving uh marine final comment from your side on the value and then we will come to the profession's role with ethics and trust what as a profession as a acca uh, we should be demonstrating or doing to make sure that ethics and trust is uh, is delivered within the businesses. So, Mariam, valuation and what investor or what the business should be looking in an investor side and what the investor should be looking in a business to really put the right kind of value. And what about the ESG scores as well? Is it the right uh, reflection in terms of the valuation? That could be another uh, way which we are seeing more and more coming up. So, Mariam. Yeah, I think... Thank you very much, um, Sajid, for the question. And author Ayla, John, you've done a good job of um, discussing this. Um, what I would add is we, we're seeing a lot of um, governments um, and even non-governmental organizations um, assist businesses or drive or steer businesses in the direction of ensuring that they're ethical and they consider ESG um, to be an important part of their strategy um, going forward. What you then see is that the businesses who do this, who prioritize ESG, who prioritize ethical practices, get rewarded by investors who want to invest in businesses that have long-term sustainability. Um, and this is good for everyone. Why is it good? Because with that, we are creating a system that rewards, you know, ethical um, practices, rewards, um, people who focus on not just short-term profitability or results, um, but are particular about the role that they play in society. And with that, you're able to attract investments. When you attract investments, of course, it has an impact on your valuations. And of course, you have the resources to further invest and to build um, your businesses as, as a result of that. Um, what I believe is that the, the, the reports are now getting a lot more robust. Um, you see a lot of organizations talking more, not just about their financial performance in their bid to satisfy stakeholders, but they're also, you know, making it an important um, part of their reports to talk about what they're doing um, to the society, what they're doing um, um to um to support public good as well what i should add is that there would require significant investments from organizations to be able to improve um esg practices within the organizations they would need to um, also collaborate a lot more um within teams to be able to actualize some of these objectives so if I think about an organization who currently uses pl plastic in their production, but wants to do away with plastic because of the issues that it poses to the, to the environment, for example, right? You would need collaboration between research, the research teams, your production teams, your marketing teams, who start to approach the way that the market, the replacement um, raw material um, differently to consumers and all of that. So this, of course, will require investment. These investments, they may not realize immediately, but what we see is that in the long term, investors notice these things that the companies are doing and they reward them by better valuations or, of course, diverting their investments into these companies. Uh, thank you, Mariam. Thank you. I think it's a... Uh... It's, it's a good good uh, uh, reference point, the ESG, and it might require more investment. And we have to look at that. If there's a proper commitment, then it should be backed by the investment with the business, with the investor, with the government. Uh, now, very quick, 30-second comment on the role of the accounting profession to uphold that ethics and trust uh, within the business and uh, make sure how we drive that one. So, John, we start from your side. 30-second, accounting profession's role. 
so um, the accounting profession is critical to to um, driving that uh, ethics and trust. Uh, you know, what are we if we are not um, trustworthy and trusted business advisors? Um, you know, we, we there is fintech around to, to to do the numbers. So as accountants, we have to add um, value. We have to provide you know that that level of trust, and we also have to uh, provide it with a foundation, an ethical foundation, and that helps our clients. Um, and those clients can be the you know big business, small business. Um, we shouldn't forget small businesses drive uh, drive most economies. Um, and certainly that's you know when you're looking at diversity, that may be where small businesses uh, get get it from is from their accountants. Thank you. I think it's an important one, the small business and how they are the backbone for any economy uh, and the GDP. So Lee, final comment from your side, the role of uh, profession uh, to uphold uh, trust in public. Uh, Lee, you are on mute right now. Arthur? Oh, that's my turn. Yeah, Sorry. there's some concern. To me, I think the, the, the we accountants is uh, we always have a servant leader in terms of ethical behaviors I and mean, promotion. We should be lead by example that we demonstrate to the others we have the knowledge. We know, we know, I mean, we know the things what should be behaved ethically. And we are also always a person that people will turn to, to, to give them expert I mean, knowledge and advice when they have ethical issues. Because we know the numbers, we know what's going on in the whole company, in the whole what's going on, and I mean, a lot of processes. So, so, so we, be, we should be the kind of the expert, we need by example, the leader in kinds of ethical behavior. And always, and always, most of the accountants, if not CEO, I mean, we are the left hand man of the CEO, then we should be the trusted advisor to the CEO of the whole company that everybody on ethical things, they will come to us and we be a chance of a leader in terms of ethical promotion. Thank you, Arthur. Ayla, and uh, Mariam, then I'll come to you for the final comment. Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, when we are talking about ethics, we actually demonstrate that and we practice it through by, by way of practice. So at ACCA, this is something that, of course, we believe in. And uh, within the organization, our relationship with any of the stakeholders, um, ethics is, of course, is an actual practice, and it's being demonstrated as, as well. Uh, commitment to transparency, it's, it's at the forefront. Uh, that also plays a very, very critical role. And now, what is that we as an organization or we as individual sort of members of, of this accounting body, what is that we can do? Um, we can, of course, promote this more. We can practice this more. And of course, share our knowledge and experience. Um, uh, the more we uh, demonstrate, the more we share, uh, this then becomes just the norm and, uh, and, and, and the path uh, which uh, which is then becomes so important to follow, and anyone deviating from it would then be uh, sort of um, would uh, would find it extremely problem uh, problematic. Uh, when we look at more evolved societies, uh, better performing companies, it is then all of this becomes a culture. Uh, so by practice, demonstration, sharing of knowledge and experience, we are actually creating a much diverse, much larger culture, which will eventually have a very positive impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ayla. Mariam, final comment from your side. Let me just add that as accountants, we have to walk the talk, right? We shouldn't just talk about ethics. You know, people with every experience that they have with us as professional ac accountants, should see ethics in everything that we do. Um, we should remain the beacon of light for ethics in all of the conversations that we have with, within our organizations and outside of our ex organizations. And of course, as the role of accountants evolves to being more of business partners, you know, we shouldn't succumb to the pressures that um, you know, we face as business leaders. We should remember that at the core of our DNA is ethics. Now, uh, thank you, Mariam. I think very rightly put, it's a uh, uh, walk the talk stop. Uh, if we are accountant, we have to make sure that uh, we uphold that public trust and we really demonstrate those ethical behavior, uh, regardless of the environment and in the face of adversity at the same time. So uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, CPG Group, Nutshell Conferences, uh, to 
to really have us in the Leaders in Islamabad Business Summit. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and I hope our audience will as well. Uh, I think just to summarize it, we have explored the ethical practices in the context of technology, diversity and inclusion, sustainability, transparency and assurance. And I think it's a it's a paramount thing that uh, ethical practices are not only can be implemented through the regulation and the, the framework. I think it's a culture processes and the feedback mechanism and the people who feel safe is an important area. Diversity in the management uh, and particularly in the leadership really ensures that the practices which are being deployed and the thought process which is being reflected is, is quite inclusive. And uh, that's basically create a certain uh, automatic control around that where the, the cartels should not be made and the people should not be following each other, but it's actually delivering the value that they have committed uh, to the organization. ACCA provides a lot of uh, professional insight and I will invite all the audience to really visit ACCA website and look on the professional insight which is uh, exploring the different dimensions of the ethics and how the future is going to uh, to uh, unveil the different opportunities and challenges for us and how and what are the responses or appropriate responses we can create there. So stay connected. Look at the professional insight and uh, enjoy this uh, session. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope you will be. Thank you very much. And uh, that's where we end the session. Thank you.